Welcome to another episode of Fear the Old Lore, where we examine the shared themes between FromSoft games to gain a better understanding of the lore. In this episode, we'll take an extensive look at the various aspects of the Abyss, the Deep, the Dark, how they serve as a kind of afterlife, and just what the Dark means in Dark Souls. Let's begin. One of the most common questions asked about Dark Souls is, what is the Dark? While it's easy to say Dark is the absence of light, it takes on a more metaphysical role representing something inherent deep within man, yet it's also one of the primary forces of nature. In the age of ancients, the world was unformed, shrouded by fog. A land of grey crags, arch trees, and everlasting dragons. But then there was fire, and with fire came disparity, heat and cold, life and death, and of course, light and dark. Then, from the dark, they came. The opening cinematic of Dark Souls 1 seems to establish dualities produced by the disparity of the first flame. Without heat, you cannot have cold. Without life, you cannot have death. And without light, you cannot have dark. While it's common to see depictions of light being diametrically opposed to the dark, the dualism at the heart of Dark Souls may be closer to what's found in Eastern religions like Hinduism, Taoism, and Zen Buddhism, where elements that seem opposed to each other work together to create balance or harmony in the universe. Perhaps the most well-known example of this comes from the yin-yang, where its light and dark sides create a whole greater than the sum of its parts. If one were to consume the other, light and dark would cease to have meaning and balance would be destroyed. In many cultures, darkness is associated with death and evil, so the dark is often seen to exist in opposition to the forces of life or good. With mankind being born from the dark and dark souls, it raises questions of what it's meant to represent in the games, especially if it isn't antithetical to life as it's commonly portrayed. On the contrary, in spells like Homing Soul Mass and Dark Souls 1 and 3, the connections between life and the dark are made explicit. Life originates in the soul, no wonder the soul mass draws toward it. This sorcery is a window into Seeker Logan's methods. And, this sorcery may offer a clue as to what Logan sought, but further investigation suggests its attraction to living things mirrors the nature of the dark. The reason Logan's spells mirror the dark is that the more the spell is granted life, or a will of its own, the more it resembles the dark as it's implied in the Black Serpent spell of Dark Souls 3. Be it sorcery or pyromancy, all techniques that infringe on humanity lead to the same place. That is to say, they all seek a will of their own. It isn't always clear, but in Soulsborne games, life is tied to willpower. Bloodborne may be the most explicit in that it says that the HP stat is literally the will to survive, and in Dark Souls, one only goes hollow after they've lost the will to carry on. Having the perseverance to face adversity is one of the core themes of these games, and as long as one has the willpower to continue, they'll never truly die or go hollow. When spells like Homing Soul Mass are given life or wills of their own, they mirror the nature of the dark because they're drawn to the life within their target. The pursuers or affinity spells of 1, 2, and 3 expand upon the idea. Unfortunately, due to the abstract language used in their descriptions, a little information was lost in translation and wound up scattered between all three games. It's still possible to discern in English, it just takes a bit of intuition and reading between the lines of all three games to understand. For the sake of clarity, Pursuers and Affinity of 1, 2, and 3 all have the same name and are called Omonotachi in Japanese, so they're meant to be the same spell. As for the descriptions, Affinity in 2 is the closest to the Japanese and says it's an advanced text based on an ancient sorcery. Creates a dark mass that seems to pursue its target with a will of its own. It appears to be a manifestation of an emotion. Perhaps of hate. Perhaps of love. Despite having almost identical source text, the English descriptions in 1 and 3 have significant differences. Pursuers in Dark Souls 1 states, Sorcery of Manus, Father of the Abyss. Grant a fleeting will to the dark of humanity and volley the result. The will feels envy, or perhaps love, 
and despite the inevitably trite and tragic ending, the will sees no alternative and is driven madly towards its target. An affinity in Dark Souls 3 says it's a forbidden dark sorcery, casts a dark manifestation of humanity. It appears to be an expression of envy, or perhaps love towards another that will tenaciously pursue its target, even if, like so many human desires, it amounts to nothing but misfortune. Both versions miss an important detail and end up highlighting different aspects of the spell. In one, Pursuer says it grants a will to the spell, which is what causes it to pursue its target, whereas Affinity in 3 misses the portion about wills completely, but clarifies the emotions are born out of love and envy towards another. It's a bit stronger in Japanese, but the wills imparted into the spell aren't just drawn towards another, they're drawn more specifically towards man. These descriptions reveal that when the dark is given a will of its own, it will pursue man out of love, envy, and hatred for being alive. Because the dark is drawn towards life, it homes in on its target, which is why homing soul mass is said to mirror the nature of the dark. Multiple sources support this. The humanity sprites found in the chasm of the abyss are drawn towards the player, and mere contact with them drains life. The Firekeeper souls in 1 mention their souls are draws for humanity, and in 3, the Deep Soul spell says, souls which swell from the deep pursue their target, drawn towards life. Dark Souls 2 may expand upon this idea the most with its Children of the Abyss. Discussing the Children of the Abyss can be challenging partially due to how abstractly and distinctly each one is represented. Each child is motivated by a different emotion, with Alana representing wrath, Alsana fear, Nadalia loneliness, and Nashandra want or yearning. At first, these emotions may seem fairly different, or even incompatible with each other, but they're all ultimately rooted in the same desire to pursue life through attaining powerful souls. In many ways, fear and desire are set up as polar opposites, and when Carla agrees to teach her dark sorceries to the player, she says, There is one thing that you should know. There is a darkness within man, and I am afraid you will peer into it. Whether the fear will spark self-reflection or a ruinous nostalgia, is up to you entirely. The self-reflection Carla mentions is supposed to be evocative of the fear, dread, or regret for delving into the dark, and the ruinous nostalgia she speaks of is a kind of yearning desire for home. At first, they may seem like they have nothing to do with each other, but they're two sides of the same coin. Desire represents attraction and fear repulsion. Together, they propel the drive to perpetuate life. While yearning for power is self-explanatory, the fear people face when confronting the dark comes from a fear of death. Her English lines aren't as direct, but Alsana's Japanese dialogue reveals the reason she sought the Ivory King was because she was afraid of disappearing. While Nier is similar in that once he fell to the abyss, he was gripped by a fear of true darkness and pleaded to the gods for the first time, and if the holy relics he relies on to call the dark are destroyed, he'll be forcibly dragged away and consumed by it. Fear can consume and lead to ruin, which ties into Arena and Pyromancy. The first time we see Arena, she's literally quivering in fear. Touch her, and she'll say, Your touch has freed me from the darkness. You are a champion, then. I am weak and unfit to tend the flames. Her Japanese lines emphasize it's because she's weak that she cannot become a firekeeper. If Falcon is correct in Dark Souls 2, and that the frailty of the weak disrupts the dark, then it may imply Arena's situation as a product of her own weak psyche. If so, it would feed into what one of the white-faced locust preachers in the Ringed City says about her. And so, she lived in fear of the dark, of the things that gnawed at her flesh, and yet, the abyss hath yet to produce any such creature. Fear not the dark, my friend and let the feast begin. While the Locust Preacher should be treated with skepticism since it could be deliberately trying to mislead the player, its dialogue aligns with Falcons, and how the Firekeeper robes in Dark Souls 3 mentions, only those who cherish the writhing, searing darkness were given the Keeper's black attire. Arena's fear and weak will prevents her from embracing the dark, which agitates it and causes it to nibble at her flesh. This in turn reinforces her fears, creating a vicious cycle where she'll fall into despair without outside intervention, which is why she begs the player to touch her. 
It might seem counterintuitive that the dark would consume man since they're born of it, but spells like Dark Fog describe the dark as a poison that reflects man's cruelty against his own. The Red Eye Orb of One muses that the dark race who steal the humanity of others and plunge further into the dark may be more human than we. Together, they reflect the true nature of life in the dark, to consume or be consumed. With the dark being cannibalistic towards its own, only the strong will survive. This power dynamic raises a fundamental question. Is it because of Arena's fear that she's weak, or is it because she lacks a strong will that she's afraid? A hint to the answer may be found in part of Quailana's dialogue. Pyromancy is the art of invoking and manipulating fire. But remember one thing. Always fear the flame. Lest you be devoured by it and lose yourself. I would hate to see that happen again. Of course, there's a difference between pyromancy and the dark, but there are remarkable similarities between them. There are dark pyromancies, and both fire and the dark can fascinate and bewitch those who yearn for power. Those who forget their fear and become seduced by power can become consumed by it, as evidenced by the Witch of Isolith and the Chaos Flame, or the Four Kings and Dark Race with Humanity. Their example should make it clear that just being devoid of fear doesn't make someone strong. Thus, it may be as Arena says. The reason she cannot become a firekeeper is because she's weak. Because she's weak, she's afraid, and it agitates the darkness within her. If only those who cherish the writhing darkness can become firekeepers, then why does Arena only become one after teaching all the miracles not affiliated with darkness from her? Perhaps by having her teach the player so many miracles, she becomes reassured by her own power and it settles the anxiety within her. With her nerves calmed, she's finally able to face the darkness and embrace it. As Affinity in Dark Souls 2 implies, the dark may be a mass of emotions, and Profound still says a locus of dark thoughts or emotions reflects the true essence of life itself. Between these descriptions and the Ring Knight set in three saying that the arms of early men were forged in the abyss and betray a smidgen of life, it's evident that the dark itself is connected to emotions and contains a primal form of life. Emotions may have a role in imparting life into non-living things. Game director Hidetaka Miyazaki expands on this in two interviews. In Game no Shokutaku, he says, The stone dragon is not alive. The ancient dragons are half-living, half-element, so there's no pain for them. In the opening cinematic, it's shown that they were there before there was life. So yeah, they don't feel pain. Kind of like Akuma Shogun from the Kinikuman series. He doesn't possess its own body, so he doesn't feel pain. And in his Dark Souls 1 Design Works interview, he adds, I'm also a huge fan of the Gaping Dragon. It's a little different from the other dragons in the world. It's part of an ancient race of mineral-based life forms existing since long before the emergence of mankind. Yet, despite its superiority over us, its time has passed, and it finds itself alone in the world the last of its race forced to survive in any way it can. As to what triggered this change, well, the emergence of life corrupted it. It was warped by emotion and desire. I think one of the most significant aspects of this interview is that it establishes the everlasting dragons were corrupted specifically by emotion and desire. It reinforces what's in the games, since dragons are immortal beings that exist beyond the cycle of the flame, and the path of the dragon's ultimate goal is to enter a higher plane of existence by transcending one's ego. Following the path of the dragon is similar to attaining nirvana in many branches of Buddhism. Removing one's attachment to the material world leads to enlightenment, which then allows one to accept and transcend the nature of reality. The stronger one's attachment to the physical world, the harder it will be to attain enlightenment. Despite being a dragon, Seath lacks the stone scales of immortality necessary to be an everlasting dragon. His mortality causes him to become fixated on life to the point he's called Moshu in Japanese, which is a Buddhist term used to express attachment or fixation to the point of delusion and prevents one from attaining nirvana. It's ironic, but the way to attain immortality or everlasting life is to let go of life and one's desires. But Seath cannot and his blindness is likely meant to be symbolic of his delusion. Between Seath and Logan, who tries to attain enlightenment while holding on to his humanity, it's clear that true enlightenment lies beyond the self, and attempts to retain it will cause one to descend into madness. The same is true for King Osiris, 
whose fixation on becoming a dragon or creating the perfect heir is rooted in greed and selfishness, both of which are contrary to the nature of true dragons. Nothing makes this clearer than the descriptions of the covetous serpent rings throughout all three games. Because snakes are creatures capable of devouring creatures larger than they are whole, they're associated with greed and gluttony, which are precisely what caused the gaping dragon to become warped and corrupted. Additionally, snakes are described as imperfect dragons and symbols of the undead. It's most likely because of their greed that they failed to become proper dragons. So if greed and desire are associated with life and humanity, then it may imply letting go of them can allow one to attain enlightenment and escape the cycle of death and rebirth. If true, it would help explain how Goff imparts an emotion to each and every completed carving, which helps him achieve personal enlightenment in his face carvings of Dark Souls 1. It's unfortunate we don't see or hear about what happens to him after the events of Ulysseal unfold, assuming the player doesn't kill him. It's possible Goff becomes a tree similar to the other giants in Dark Souls 2, and it's worth noting the description of the seed of a tree of giants says, Death is not the end, for anything that has ever once lived remains part of a great cycle of regeneration. But what of those outside the cycle? At the very least, it shows there's a way to leave the cycle, but what lies beyond it is a mystery. Considering that before the time of fire, there was only mist, gray crags, arch trees, and the everlasting dragons, it doesn't seem impossible that those who leave the cycle could transform into one of them. By the time of Dark Souls 3, we can see hollows who have begun transforming into trees, and throughout Lothric there are a number of hollows who transform into pus of men, serpent-like creatures which can later become wyverns. It seems unlikely that the pus of men are related to true everlasting dragons since they are manifestation of the abyss. However, it's said in the dragon scales of Dark Souls 2 that, touching an ancient dragon scale gives one a glimpse into the abyss. So maybe there is more to the connection between the Puss of Man and Everlasting Dragons. Could it be that going hollow and losing one's will brings them closer to dragons? If so, then perhaps losing one's mind as a hollow and only being left with an insatiable hunger for souls causes their transformations to be imperfect and prevents them from becoming true Everlasting Dragons. Assuming this is the case, it could explain why they transform into wyverns, or why they resemble serpents as pus of men instead of true everlasting dragons. Nonetheless, the line about dragon scales allowing one to peer into the abyss remains one of the most mystifying in the entire series. If we were to take them as having belonged to true everlasting dragons, would it imply that they themselves are abyssal creatures? I believe so, but I've heard it argued that the dragon scales of two originally belonged to Calamite. Regardless, he's described as the last everlasting dragon. So if the everlasting dragons are abyssal, does this mean they're related to the dark? Not necessarily. Though at times the abyss and the dark are treated as synonyms, there are a few factors which lead me to believe they're related but separate concepts. The term abyss comes from Xinyan in Japanese, and like in English, it's used to refer to the depths of chasms, ravines, pits, and bodies of water. In real-life mythology, the abyss is associated with the primordial waters of the cosmic sea of creation and can be thought of as a limbo that contains the spirits of the dead and the unliving. Because of its formless nature, the abyss is often described as chaos. Despite being fundamentally chaotic, the depths of the abyss are so vast they can ironically be considered tranquil or serene. This obviously has a lot of tie-ins to the dark and the deep, but with the scales of dragons being associated with the abyss, it leads me to believe the abyss is separate from the dark, and it likely existed during the Age of Ancients. One of the difficulties in talking about this is that we're only given information about the abyss as it exists post disparity, after the first flame has already altered the world. Rather than trying to focus on what the abyss may have been like before fire, it may be more relevant to ask what would happen to it if the first flame were to fade. In the end of fire ending of Dark Souls 3, when the world fades to black, the Firekeeper says, The first flame quickly fades. Darkness will shortly settle. But one day, tiny flames will dance across the darkness. like embers linked by Lord's Pass.
While this doesn't say much about the abyss directly, it shows there's a cycle of life, death, and rebirth in the first flame itself, and that even should it die, it'll appear again one day beyond the horizon. But this poses some problems. If the dark only exists as a product of the disparity the flame creates, if it were to fade, wouldn't the world return to a state without darkness like it was during the Age of Ancients? I'd argue based on the Dragon Scales of 2 and the Locust Preacher's dialogue in 3 that the state of the world without fire is abyssal. Part of my rationale for this is based on how the Locust Preachers talk about the abyss. 1. Met the dark with learning, but in the end learned his knowledge was wanting. The world began without knowledge, and without knowledge will it end. Does not this ring clear and true? Fear not the dark, my friend. And let the feast begin. One poor girl slew her own kin, but even so was embraced, enveloped by the abyss. It was a comfort that neither moon nor sunless sky afforded her before. Fear not the dark, my friend, and let the feast begin. Where fire resideth, shadows twist and shrivel. But in the abyss, there are shadows none. Fear not the dark, my friend, and let the feast begin. Since the Locust Preacher's dialogue can be interpreted multiple ways, it makes it more difficult to say whether the abyss should be considered separate from the dark. It's possible to interpret the line about shadows existing where fire resides to mean that the fire is absent in the abyss and that the abyss should be devoid of darkness. Yet it's also possible to take the lines to mean that the abyss is so far gone within the dark that fire and shadow cannot reach it. When the Locust Preacher's lines about fire and shadows are taken in conjunction with the lines about the sun and moon being no comfort, I think it's meant to indicate the abyss shouldn't be affiliated with the light or the dark. Instead, the abyss may be kind of like the concept of Shunyata in Buddhism, in which the potential for all existence is contained within emptiness. However, Saying shunyata is merely emptiness or formlessness fails to convey its full meaning. For example, in order for there to be form, there must first be formlessness. If we were to take some clay, say that it represents form, then shape it into a cup, it would be easy to say that the form of the cup comes from the clay that it's made out of, but this would critically ignore what allows the cup to function, its formlessness. Obviously a cup isn't formless, but it's only because of the emptiness inside it that a cup can function. Unfortunately, because form and formlessness are dual-natured, it's often assumed in the West that emptiness is the product of not having form, which can imply a deficiency of sorts. However, it may be more appropriate to think that by having a fixed form, something is intrinsically bound or limited, whereas being formless or empty is capable of containing every potential shape or form within it. The abyss in Dark Souls is probably analogous to this kind of formlessness, and acts as a cradle which contains and exists throughout the universe. However, once the first flame appears, it projects disparity onto the world, altering the abyss as well. Unfortunately, we're not given much information about the world or the Age of the Ancients, which leaves some pretty fundamental questions unanswered. For instance, does the first flame create the dark? As in, is darkness produced directly from the flame? Or has dark always existed, and it's only from the first flame producing light that dark is made distinct? If darkness is produced by the first flame, it would mean that the dark is projected onto the world, and the dragons, crags, and arch trees shouldn't be considered dark since they predate it. If the state of the world before the fire is truly abyssal, or non-dual, then it could explain why dragon scales are abyssal, yet not necessarily related to the dark or humanity. Since the first flame brings duality, that which isn't light is dark, and the parts of the world furthest from the fire, the abyss, would be called dark by default. If the world is already dark before the first flame appears, it would align with how the world becomes blanketed in darkness and the end of fire ending of Dark Souls 3. Without light, dark would lose meaning, but it wouldn't necessarily cease to exist, and the world could exist in the midst of a boundless abyss. One glaring issue with this perspective is that if the dark is related to desire or emotion, then why would dragons be devoid of them within the dark-filled abyss? It may be that without the fire, the dragons lack desire because there's nothing to desire. The first flame brings light and life to the world. When it does, the dark is drawn to it like moss to a flame, 
or the countless bits of humanity that nibble at a firekeeper's soul. The everlasting dragons are also affected, and their new desires can eventually transform them into creatures like the gaping dragon who's consumed by its own hunger. If the dragons in the arch trees are abyssal, then it could serve as a link to explain why the hollows in Dark Souls 3 can transform into trees and wyverns. There is reason to believe either worldview, but I am partial to believing the abyss isn't dark originally, as it would support how the dragon chime in Dark Souls 2 retains a sense of sublime purity despite sitting in the dark chasm for a long time. Additionally, it wouldn't make as much sense for Madir to be changed by consuming the dark if he was dark to begin with. What may be the biggest thorn in the side to the idea that the Abyss predated the first flame is that Manus is called the Father of the Abyss. His Japanese name is Shinan no Araji Manasu, or Shinan no Nushi Manasu, which is a little ambiguous and can mean a few different things. While Araji can mean father as in the head of a family, it also means lord, the owner of something, or someone who brings a group of people together like a host, like how Mikalash is called the host of the nightmare in Bloodborne. Nushi includes these meanings, but it can also be used to describe the oldest or most prominent resident in a given location who has special spiritual connections or powers that relates to the area, and they're often considered the guardian of it as a result. One example of this kind of connection to an area exists in Sekiro with a great cart master in the Fountainhead Palace. Because of its size and age, it's given a kind of mystical status by the pot nobles, and it can be considered the guardian of the Great Lake. So while it's undeniable that Manus has a connection to the Abyss, and parts of it have spawned from him as Elizabeth says, it's more likely that Manus serves as its avatar, rather than its creator, since the arms used by the Ring Knights in the Dragon Wars were already forged out of the Abyss. Believe it or not, Ulysseel has brought the Abyss upon itself, fooled by that toothy serpent. They upturned the grave of primeval man, and incited his ornery wrath. What could they have been thinking? But to you and I, it's all ancient history. We don't have the exact details of how and why Manus was unearthed from his grave, and we're left to infer that what caused Manus to rampage was his broken pendant being stolen from him. It caused his emotions or humanity to run wild, and the darkness it produced threatened to swallow everything if left unchecked. From Manus' example, we can see emotions encapsulated by the dark have great power and the ability to transform those who come into contact with them. However, his is not the only case of emotions riding high causing a transformation or sudden surge in power. In the fight with Sister Frida and Father Ariandel, once Frida is defeated, Father Ariandel will smash his kiln onto her blood, and his blood and rage will rekindle Sister Frida and reignite the fire of the painted world. Each of the Lords of Cinder have a phase where they become embered, and while we can't say each instance is the product of emotions running wild, each boss transitions into using more serious or desperate attacks in order to stay alive. Even though he isn't a Lord of Cinder, Gale may have one of the most interesting changes for a boss. When he shifts into the cutscene for a second phase, dark blood pours over his sword, and he'll gradually become enveloped in a bloody red mist that resembles fire as he stands up. However, the flames surrounding him likely don't come from fire, since he deals dark damage throughout his second and third phases of the fight. Instead, it probably comes from his blood that's been infused with the dark souls of the pygmies he's consumed in the Ring City and the Dreg Heap at the end of the world. I'll admit my first, even second time playing through the game, I didn't understand what exactly was going on with Gale's search for the blood of the dark soul. It didn't make much sense to me that a metaphysical object like a soul could contain blood, or why it was necessary for the painted world of Ariamis. When I first saw that the blood of the Dark Soul said it was used as a pigment by the Painter Girl, and that the blood of the Pygmy Lords had dried long ago, I thought it was literally saying that their dried blood was used as the pigment, and the red stuff hanging from the sides of its picture was its dried blood. After looking at the Japanese, I've come to a few different conclusions, but again, I'd like to be clear this is more of a personal interpretation of the game's text in a way that makes more sense to me. Rather than the blood being literally dry, it's meant more metaphorically, with the term karehate being closer to withered in English. So basically, when Gale went to get the blood of the pygmy lords for the painting, he discovered they had no blood. Once he came to this realization, he decided to consume the pygmies so that he may absorb their dark souls into his blood. His soul makes it clear he knew he was no champion, and so he wouldn't be able to resist being possessed by their dark souls. Thus, he knew it was a suicide mission, and placed his trust in the champion of Ash to kill him, and take the blood of the dark souls of the painting girl. As for why it's called the blood of the Dark Soul, it could come down to an issue of translation. This may be pedantic, 
but instead of calling it Blood of the Dark Soul, it may be more appropriate to think of it as Dark Soul Blood. In other words, it doesn't have to be blood from a soul at all, but rather a kind of blood that's been infused with souls. I realize this is quite a discrepancy, and part of the issue comes from the ambiguity of how the no particle is used in Kurai Tamashi no Chi. While the no particle is often used to denote possession, it's also used when nouns modify other nouns. In many cases, we can use of in English to approximate the function of the no particle, but it doesn't always work. For example, Taiyo no talisman is sunlight talisman, with Taiyo meaning sun. If we said it was the talisman of the sun though, contextually, we know that of the sun describes what kind of talisman it is, and it isn't saying that the talisman comes from the sun. Unfortunately, blood of the dark soul doesn't come across the same way, so the most natural way to understand it in English makes it sound as though the blood comes from the dark soul rather than just being blood that contains dark souls. So with Gale consuming the pygmies, their dark souls have been absorbed into his blood, functionally making it dark soul blood. It's still a strange concept, but I think it begins to make a little more sense when we compare Gale's situation to the Abyss Watchers, Sister Frida, and things like Ritual Blood and the Executioner's Gloves in Bloodborne. By imbibing the blood of the wolf, the Abyss Watchers of Farron's Undead Legion were united as one, and during the transition to the second phase of their fight, the blood of the Abyss Watchers becomes concentrated into one individual who reassumes their role as the Lord of Cinder. This shows that blood can be used as a vessel to store the soul, and that by mixing blood, one soul can be shared between others. Thus, when Father Ariandel ignites Sister Frida's blood, he may be pouring his own blood onto hers to revive her with his soul. From Life Gems, we know souls have the ability to restore life, but they can also be converted to increase max HP in spells like Resonant Flesh, or even Dark Projectiles in Resonant Soul. With Gale having Dark Soul blood, his body is possessed by innumerable spirits, and when he uses particularly strong attacks, a number of red skulls are unleashed from his body. To many people, these attacks feel out of place or that they'd fit better in a game like Bloodborne where enemies like Martyr Logaria shoot similar kinds of skulls. If anything, this shows thematic parallels between the games and that spirits of the dead can inhabit the blood in both Bloodborne and Dark Souls. Bloodborne is just more overt about it. The divide between blood and soul is unclear, but with the pygmies devoid of blood in the Ringed City, they're probably not meant to be completely synonymous. Nonetheless, the state of Gale's dark soul blood indicates there's a connection between blood, souls, and the dark, and they're all used to sustain the painted world. There are numerous similarities between the painted world and Lothric or Lordran. Both are comprised of souls in a way, and linked to a cycle of fire. Only, the painted world is set up as a kind of shadow or foil to Lothric and Lordran. Instead of trying to prolong the current age, the painted world needs to be cleansed in flame before life can flourish anew. Oh, my, thank you. I can hear the crackling from here. The sound of my home. The painting of Ariandel. Burning away. When the world rots, we set it afire for the sake of the next world. It's the one thing we do right, unlike those fools on the outside. <laughs> the Corvian Settler makes it clear. If the world persists too long, it will begin to rot. Rot forming as the result of prolonged stagnation is unique from soft recontextualization of Buddhist and Shinto principles of Yodomi, or lack of flow. If we take the idea of Yodomi or stagnation and compare it to a pool of water, the basic idea is that if there's enough flow within the water, the impurities within it will be washed away. If that water comes to a standstill, the impurities can settle within it and become a breeding ground for vermin attracted to filth. One way from software subverts common tropes is that while impurity is usually seen as the primary source of sin and evil, the games make it so that stagnation as the result of attachment and desire can be considered the true sin. However, Lord Gwyn trembled at the dark, clinging to his age of fire and in dire fear of humans and the Dark Lord who would one day be born amongst them. Lord Gwyn resisted the course of nature by sacrificing himself to link the fire and commanding his children to shepherd the humans. 
Gwyn has blurred your past to prevent the birth of the Dark Lord. As Koth makes clear, Gwyn subverts the natural cycle of the universe by artificially prolonging the Age of Fire. This creates a kind of stagnant world where humans are trapped in a state between life and death until they lose their minds and go hollow. By the time of Dark Souls 3, we learn continually linking the flame and prolonging the Age of Fire is undesirable, as the world itself becomes rotten and misshapen, and linking less and less effective as time goes on. In the end of Fire Ending, the Fire Keeper reveals... The first flame quickly fades. Darkness will shortly settle. But one day, tiny flames will dance across the darkness. Like embers linked by Lord's Pass. Fire doesn't need to be linked for life to continue. It exists in cycles, and Gwyn's linking the flame disrupts the cycle by locking it in place. From a Shinto perspective, disrupting the flow of nature creates imbalance and stagnation. From a Buddhist one, Gwyn's attempt to hold on to the Age of Fire can be viewed as another kind of stagnation born from an attachment to life. By perpetuating it, he prolongs suffering. Rosaria's fingers and three symbolize just what happens when the cycle is subverted too many times. Her followers used her powers of rebirth too often, causing their bodies to become twisted and misshapen in the form of mangrubs. If the player does the same, a prompt will appear on screen saying they cannot be reborn anymore, lest they turn into a mangrub themselves. If linking the flame is akin to rebirth, then perhaps something similar to becoming a mangrub is happening to Lothric in the first flame. The Corvian settler seems to think so. Unlike the painted world which rots visibly, Lothric may also be rotting but in a different way. This is more speculation on my part, but perhaps the deep symbolizes Lothric's rotten stagnation. But what do we know about it? The Cathedral of the Deep was originally a way of white institution that most likely venerated Kaitha, the goddess of tears, but was later taken over by followers of the Deep. It's uncertain why the Deep's followers were attracted to Kaitha's cathedral, but it may be due to her connection to blood, tears, and the dark. As the goddess of tears, Many tales of death surrounded her since she mourned for the dead. However, in addition to shedding pure blue tears, she was also known to shed tears as red as blood. It's unlikely Kaitha is meant to be a god of blood like Naralma, but with rumors of Kaitha being a demoness, and her chime being more suited to hexes and miracles of the dark, she remains an enigmatic figure of worship. Perhaps the reason Kaitha's cathedral was converted to the Cathedral of the Deep was due to discovering the allure of dark through blood. A number of deep affiliated items are related to blood and inflict bleed. The spiked mace, warden twin blades, flamberge, gnaw, and the corpse maggots all inflict bleed, and the notched whip used for ritual bloodletting is found in the cleansing chapel nearby. But this doesn't explain why the Cathedral of the Deep would have been interested in bloodletting in the first place. The answer to that may lie in the statues scattered throughout the area. The ones inside the cathedral depict men hunched over with malformed, pus-covered backs that look as though they're on the verge of bursting open, and the other statues nearby show a kind of winged serpent-like creatures sprouting from their backs. It's possible these statues depict pus of men, but it's notable the hollows who transform into them lack the same kind of cysts on their backs. Nonetheless, we know from their examples as well as Udex Gundir that the pus of man bursts out of the back, and it might relate to how the Cleric Blue set says that they bore large covers on their backs, to ensure they would not become seedbeds for spreading darkness. Covering one's back to contain the darkness inside may have also been practiced by the Pilgrims of Londor. It isn't known what they covered their backs with, but their shells bear a resemblance to shiving stones which undo weapon infusions, so maybe they wear them on their backs to purify the darkness within them. With men being potential seedbeds of the dark, it may have been thought that bloodletting can cleanse one of their inner darkness, and if the Rose of Ariandel is any indication, they may have flayed their backs where the dark was known to take root. At the very least, it's shown in the Warden Twin Blades that bleeding the undead was thought to slow reincarnation, 
so they would have been exposed to blood throughout that process as their clothes are drenched in the blood and mucilage of their undertaking. Constant exposure to the dark and the blood may have been what inspired the followers of the deep, and despite being granted blessings protecting them from it, in time, those dedicated to sealing away the horrors of the deep succumb to their very power. Surprisingly, there are a number of thematic overlaps between Aldrich and the Deacons of the Deep to Artorius and the Abyss Watchers. The Deacons of the Deep fell to darkness despite trying to seal it away, just as the Abyss Watchers acted in the dark, seeking out any sign of the Abyss, fighting a constant war with his abominations. Their struggles were in vain, and the Japanese version of the Wolf Knight set makes it clear that the Abyss Watchers see their own end in the armor of Artorius, which remains ever damp through the Abyss. It seems those who face the dark are doomed to join it. Just like the Abyss Watchers gained their mandate as a lord from mixing their souls with Artorius and the Wolf's blood, Aldrich is said to have gained his power as a lord through consuming men. Of course, these may not seem similar at all at first, but if we consider how Gale consumes the pygmies and gains the power of the Dark Soul in his blood, and more than enough power to rival Aldrich and the other lords of Cinder, the comparisons begin to make more sense. Unlike Gale and the Abyss Watchers who remain humanoid, Aldrich's body is bloated beyond recognition and deteriorated into little more than sentient sludge. Again, we're not given direct reasons as to why his transformation differs from the others. It could have been a byproduct from when he linked the flame, or it may have to do with his consumption of man, since those who do often end up becoming enlarged or normally deformed. Smo, the Butchers and the Undead Berg, Maneater Mildred, the Covetous Demon, Demon of Song, Aldrich, and even Gale in his boss form are bloated compared to their standard counterparts, and animals that eat the corpses of men like pigs and rats can swell to immense sizes. Another possibility is that as things die, they become rotten and bloated. As their bodies break down, the darkness within them seeps out and congeals into things like human dregs or the masses of souls found in New Londo. If Aldrich was consuming such things and placing his religious faith in it, Perhaps his body came to resemble it just like how the followers of Elka became Corvians, or how the Batwing demons and Belgar Goyles in Anor Orlando came to use lightning instead of fire in their attacks. Generally speaking, size isn't the best indicator of strength in these games, but it does have a connection with being fat or glutton greed that's worth mentioning. In the final line of Doris's gnawing, instead of saying Doris is sure to have wallowed in this darkness, intoxicated by its peril, the Japanese says something like, she must have been intoxicated because she was fat. Without additional context, the line could come across as being somewhat offensive, so the small change doesn't surprise me, but it's unfortunate it was lost because it does a nice job of setting up some of the motivation buried within the deep. The main reason Doris being fat is relevant is that it paints her as a gluttonous being that's driven by her desires, since according to the covetous demon soul in Dark Souls 2, eating is an expression of desire. The swarm of insects she summons gnaw and rend their victim's flesh out of a similar gluttonous desire to consume life. Part of the reason we can come to this conclusion comes from the description of the deep soul which says, Souls which swell from the deep pursue their target, drawn towards life. Moreover, the insects of the deep mirror the way humanity gnaws at the firekeepers of Dark Souls 1 and Arena 3, so eating away at things may be something intrinsic to the dark. There's even a specific term in Japanese, Mushibamu, to describe how the dark eats away at the essence of things, but unfortunately there is no English equivalent for it, so it ends up a little disjointed. Mushibamu is used to describe how worms or insects chew through something, and it appears in Gnaw, Wolnir's Holy Blade, The Firekeeper Set, Dark Fog, Pestilent Mist, Resist Curse, Chaos Blade, Power Within, and Go's dialogue about how Artorius was swallowed by the Abyss. There is an affinity between insects and the creatures of the deep, and it's tied to blood, stagnation, and a ravenous hunger for life. Those possessed by the dark are driven to consume out of a covetous desire. This leads down a slippery slope, and those intoxicated by the dark do more and more depraved things to consume it, like how Aldrich enjoyed imbibing and luxuriating in the screams of his victims as they shuddered for life. It's difficult to say for sure, but the reason he may have instinctually wanted to torture his victims would be so that the darkness within them would be strengthened by their emotions. Because the dark is weighty, it sinks down to the depths and festers, congealing into dregs. This is the true nature of yodomi or stagnation. It allows for impurities to settle, and creates a seedbed from which filth and vermin can spawn. Bloodborne and Sekudo expand upon the idea further. The Carol Rune of the League, Yodomi, 
grants the ability to detect centipede-like vermin that wriggle in filth and are said to be the source of man's impurity. An interesting thing about this phrase is that it uses Hito no Yodomi, which is what human dregs are called in Dark Souls 3, though the kanji in Bloodborne is slightly different and has a broader meaning. This doesn't mean Bloodborne has human dregs like Dark Souls 3, only that there's a thematic link between vermin and stagnation across titles. In Sekiro, the infested are plagued with centipedes which prevent their host from dying and keeps them trapped in a state of artificially prolonged life. The holy chapter infested text elaborates, For an age I have been blessed by the worm. To be undying is to walk the eternal path to enlightenment. Thus, I must become enlightened to understand why I cannot die. And the Senpo esoteric text adds, Senpo temple was seized by an obsession for the undying, which corrupted their teachings and style. Obsession with life and immortality caused the monks to inject themselves with parasites so they may study the path to enlightenment and attain nirvana. But like Seath, this ironically keeps them grounded in the material world and thus makes them unable to ascend. While they may seem holy at first, these profane centipedes are likely a product of divine waters that have stagnated in the sunken valley since even the guardian ape is infected by them. We know the divine rejuvenating waters of the Pounted Head Palace converge in the valley because the lotus of the palace is found there. Lotuses are considered sacred symbols in Buddhism because they bloom in and rise out of defiled muddy water, representing the way enlightenment is attained by rising beyond the muddy and murky material world. They are also thought to cleanse impurity, which relates to how royal lotuses and demon souls remove poison. As for the lotus of the palace, it cleanses the stagnant waters of rejuvenation and allows Sekiro to metaphorically ascend to a higher realm to complete its journey of bringing an end to immortality. To tie this back to stagnation, the most stagnant areas in Soulsborne games are tied to rot and poison. These areas tend to be in swamps and lowlands like the Valley of Defilement, Blight Town, Harvest Valley, Sunken Valley, and Fair and Keep because there where all the filth and impurity gets washed away to. Without an outlet, the water in these areas stagnate and eventually turn to poison, which is why there's so many damn poisonous swamps in FromSoft games. But poison isn't limited to just water and swamps. Blood has had strong ties to rotten poison throughout the games. In Dark Souls 3, poison knives are jokingly said to be coated in Hollow's blood. In Dark Souls 2, the Manslayer's poison comes from the bloodstains of its victims, and when Yor pierced the side of the slumbering dragon sin to take its blood, it released a miasma of poison that blanketed Chova in ruin. Even dragon rot is called stagnated blood in Sekiro, and in Bloodborne, Queen Yarnum's impure blood can cause rapid poisoning. Considering how blood can hold the dark soul, and how dark fog is described as a poison for humans, the poison produced from blood could be a product of the darkness inside it. This could help contextualize how the painted world rots, or how ritual bloodletting could captivate followers of the Way of White with the allure of the dark. Unlike Sekudo, though, there are no lotuses or deities capable of cleansing the dark, so fire is the only option to cleanse the world of its impurities. But this leads to its own set of problems. The first flame is fading, and the world itself is on the verge of disappearing with it. In order to cleanse the darkness, one needs to link the flame, but ironically, this breaks the natural order or cycle of the universe and creates stagnation. Over time, continuing to link the flame causes the world to become so stagnant that the dark itself starts to become corrupted. The deep was originally a peaceful and sacred place, but the dregs of man infected it, such that the dark would burst out of men in pursuit of finding more life to devour. So what alternatives are there? If we let the fire fade, it will allow the cycle to complete itself, and one day fire will dance across the darkness, like embers linked by Lord's past. It may be easy for us to make this choice, since we don't have any particular connection to the world of Dark Souls, but to the characters in the game like Ludleth, letting the fire fade could be seen as a grand betrayal to all their loved ones and life itself. To most characters in the game, the dark is rightfully seen as a curse, and those who fall to it literally become soul-sucking monsters. Knowing this, is it then any wonder why so many would choose to link the flame? Even if one is aware that linking the flame is part of a toxic cycle, it still wouldn't be a simple decision to just abandon everything. All men trust fully the illusion of life. But is this so wrong? 
a construction facade, and yet a world full of wounds and scandals. Young no, Harlow, no. are you intent on shattering the oak, spoiling this wonderful fortune? Only those with the strength to make their will a reality can decide. One day fire will fade, and dark will become a curse. Men will be free from death, left to wander eternally. Dark will again be ours, and in our true shape, we can bury the false legends of yore. Only... Is this our only choice? Seeker of fire, coveter of the throne. Seek strength. The rest will follow. The only other alternative would be to take the flame for oneself and break the cycle completely. The hollow ending of Londor presents such an option. Again, this is conjecture, but considering how hollows are undead, can a world created in their image truly be considered one that's alive and well? Instead of transcending the cycle of life and death by freeing themselves from it, they may have doomed themselves to an eternity of attachment to the physical world. An undead one. Appearances can be deceiving, so maybe being a hollow for all eternity isn't a bad thing. But wouldn't a world without life and death be empty? The point of life in Dark Souls is to pursue living it, even if there could only be an inevitably trite and tragic ending. And so it is that Ash seeketh embers. This video was incredibly difficult to make trying to balance as much information as possible without rambling, and as a result, I know there's still a number of topics I didn't touch on. Nonetheless, I hope you enjoyed it, and I intend to revisit some of these topics in future videos. I'd like to thank my viewers, subscribers, patrons, channel members, and everyone who's left constructive comments on my videos for their support, as it really makes working on these kinds of videos feel rewarding and enjoyable. As always, please consider liking and subscribing to my channel for access to future content, or even becoming a channel member to support the community or gain early access to future materials. And remember, Fear the old lore.